Fawn Watch. Explore fawns with the edge. This episode Fawn is Watch. sponsored by UBS Explore Asset fawns Management. With the edge. This episode Fawn is sponsored Watch. by UBS Explore Asset fawns Management. With the edge. Good morning. Welcome to our first episode of Fun Watch, a new webcast series by The Edge Singapore. My name is Jeffrey, and I'll be your host for today. This webcast is proudly brought to you by The Edge Singapore and sponsored by UBS Asset Management. In today's webcast, we will discuss multi asset investing in China. Asia's economic powerhouse has been on the rise over the last decade. It has bounced back from the impact of COVID-19, stronger and quicker compared to most other countries. And its financial markets continue to surge. China, I believe, continues to present exciting investment opportunities, yet there are also risks involved. Joining me today is Jian Plebani, Portfolio Manager for the UBS China Multi-Asset Strategy. Hi, Jian. How are you today? Hey, hi, Jeffrey. Yeah, I'm very good. Thanks very much. How are you? It's a, it's a pleasure to be on here. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Great. Now, let's talk about China's economic resilience. Um, the country's recent positive economic data has shown that the country has largely shrugged off uh, the impact of COVID-19. In 2020, China is the only major country to have a positive GDP growth of 2.3%. This is simply amazing considering it has suffered from the pandemic and ongoing tensions with the US. China markets have also gone up strongly, as I've mentioned earlier. Jian, could you provide some context to its economic resilience and market performance? Yes, of course. Um, it's a great question. It has been truly impressive how China basically digged its way out of this crisis much faster than, than anybody else. And um, there is a lot of reasons for that, uh, a lot of good reasons. Uh, let, me, let me tackle the most important of them. And I also attach here a chart where you can basically see the development of the GDP growth on a quarter on quarter basis. You can see that very deep slump um, of uh, down minus seven or so on a quarter quarter um, in the, that's basically the first quarter and the COVID uh, crisis in February, March. Uh, but then you see these very sharp recoveries in the last three quarters mainly driven, and that's one of the major reasons, by the infrastructure investment, which is the red bar there. So this is the, the data in the background. But what are the reasons? Um, there is two, two folded the reasons, I would say. So the first one is on the virus side. China really has structural advantages to manage um, this crisis. Um, it has been an early mover into the crisis, but then also a much earlier mover out of the crisis. And that's because it could really implement a very sharp and hard lockdown um, regionally. We all know Wuhan has basically been closed, other regions as well, um, and it could do so very, very strictly. At the same time, basically the social behavior um, in China has been very adequate. Um, and, and that basically in combination uh, worked tremendously well to constrain the virus to only uh, small regions, and then also eliminated almost um, throughout the last couple of months, as we have seen. Um, at the same time, China has also been ready on the equipment side. Um, the rest of the world basically purchased uh, a protective gear out of China. And China has, apart from in the very, very early stages, basically always been ready and having enough protective gear, materials, um, uh, hospital places, and so forth, um, to basically uh, protect their, um, their society. Um, and that is compared to other regions, obviously, as we have seen, for example, in Europe, but particularly also other emerging market regions, a major advantage. And just one fact here, I mean, how successful China has been in, in keeping the production chains up during that crisis. Um, I think China produced uh, maybe 40% of the, of the masks um, before this crisis, so in, in, in the last years. Um, and uh, after this crisis, or now, basically, it's producing 80, 85% of, of all the masks in the world. So that basically means that the crisis didn't make um, the rest of the world more independent from China. In the opposite, it actually made them more dependent. And China could really um, improve um, uh, their sort of production capacity of these products and um, keep the, the value chain alive, basically. And that's in the opposite to all other, or most other countries. So that's um, the major reason on the virus side why. China has been so successful, basically. Um, but then on the economic side, and I already touched up on that in the, in the beginning, 
Um, when you look at this red bar, that's really how China manages the economy. So when there is a slump in the economy, they start to uh, put in a lot of uh, fiscal activity. And uh, in this regard, it was basically um, infrastructure investment. So they go out and build bridges and streets and so forth and um, basically support the economy domestically. And you can see how they did so in the last three quarters with that large red bar um, growing. Um, and that basically helped uh, to lead the economy out of crisis. And now you also see how consumption is catching up, which is the gray bar here. Um, and also the experts, as I mentioned, due to the protective gear and, and other consumer goods that the world needed, like new computers and so forth during the crisis, um, expert actually held up very, very strongly. So what do we um, expect um, as the question here is really for, for, for next year? Um, we, we can see that um, the Chinese economy is still growing about 8%. Um, over the 2021, which is significantly outperforming the rest of the world growth with about 5.5%. Um, so this is really the two factors that I mentioned, uh, how to manage the virus, but then also the very strong stimulus from the fiscal and monetary side in China that bails out um, the domestic economy. Um, let me jump to the next slide then here, because what does that mean actually for an investor? The investor is not invested in the economy. The investor is invested in the equity markets, right? Um, so what has happened to the equity markets? And here as well, you asked me, um, uh, how, how can we explain that strong um, development in the Chinese equity markets over the last years? You can see that here, that has been very, very strong indeed. Um, and, but what you can also see here is that there is significant differences between onshore markets, onshore, offshore markets, for example, you can see the red line here as the offshore market, the gray line as the onshore market. Um, but what does that mean for the markets right now? Well, first of all, they can be very volatile. You can see that here. And there is differences between the different asset classes. So you need to have someone that actually goes in and decides when do you want to be invested in which asset class. Um, and, and that's what we basically provide from UBS when we do multi-asset investment. We decide um, uh, when to go in and out of these different asset classes, which basically reduces on the one hand the volatility, um, but then gives you also this one-stop solution to all the asset classes in China um, that you can basically get access to all these different asset classes. So, but let me come back to um, why did, um, uh, did the, the equity market behave as it behaved? And you can see here, um, do we think that, um, well, first of all, obviously growth outperformance was, was significant in China versus the rest of the world. That obviously led a lot of inflows into China. I think we will touch up on that later as well. And a lot of the global of community coming into China that helped the equity markets working very well over the last years. Um, and what does that mean now? Are they expensive or not? Well, when you look, for example, versus um, the rest of the world, you can see the brown line, um, then you wouldn't say they're very expensive. Also, particularly US equities, tech sector and so forth is actually similarly or even more expensive. And particularly when you compare it to bonds, bonds are significantly more expensive. So therefore, we still think there is a lot of um, uh, attractiveness basically in the Chinese markets. Um, and therefore, we do expect for the uh, the, for the equity markets to keep outperforming over the next year. Um, for the two reasons I mentioned, they're not expensive yet. And the second one is we still see significant growth out of the China, maybe a third one, we still see, see significantly inflow into the Chinese assets. And we will, we will touch up on that um, quite a bit more later, I'm sure about that. Um, let me just jump to the, to the third chart here that I wanted to show, um, because that's, that's exactly the point about the international investors' inflows, and particularly the institutional investors' inflows. So um, we have seen a, a very strong performance of the Chinese markets uh, in the last chart, um, which has been partly driven, obviously, by major flows coming from the invest, international investor community um, into China. You can see that over the last six years, about 660% increase in those flows. Um, and this is a unique opportunity for also, say, retail investors to participate and put the money where, where the smart money is, basically, so follow the institutional investors, as they have done so over the last years. Um, and let me just try to explain why also we as institutional investors um, allocated a larger amount um, of our assets to the Chinese markets. There is several reasons, but... Um, one of them I already touched upon, there has been a tremendous growth outperformance of the Chinese uh, economy versus the rest of the world. But then from a portfolio construction perspective, there is also great benefit as the Chinese assets are still quite independent from the rest of the world. That means that you have a low correlation between say global equities and Chinese equities. And that helps you to achieve a much better diversification in your portfolio. So from a portfolio standpoint, you wanna have a significant allocation to Chinese assets to bring your overall portfolio risks down and returns up. 
so improve the sharp ratios of the portfolios in that sense. Um, and then last but not least, that's a major point here as well, is Chinese market is still a very young market. It's, it's maturing, but it's still young. And therefore there is a lot of opportunities for professional investors to, to detract alpha out of the market. So um, professionalization of the financial markets only happening right now in China. It's still dominated by retail investors. 85, 90% of daily turnover comes from the retail side. Um, and then there is structural changes in the economy going on basically from a very um, sort of um, uh, low value add manufacturing hub um, and an export oriented economy turning into this consumer oriented economy that we see now happening in China. Um, and that gives a lot of opportunities um, for active management in Chinese stock markets and picking the right, the right companies, which will be market leader going forward, going through these changes. So let me, let me summarize that here and uh, happy to take the next question. Thank you. Thank you, Jian. Uh, very quickly, I'm just going to ask you about the new US president, Joe Biden. Um, do you think tensions between China and the U.S. will ease under his administration? I mean, as we know, the U.S.-China trade war has yet to be resolved. What are your thoughts on the new U.S.-China relationship going forward? Yes, um, thank you so much. Uh, that's obviously a question that uh, burns under all of our nails, basically. Um, so we have seen a, a move from the Trump administration to Biden administration. And I think in the short term, that's actually very positive. And it has been positive for equity markets as well. And um, I use this French, um, let me go back to the other page here. So, so yeah, now you see the right chart. Um, I use this French statement, basically, c'est le ton qui fait la musique. That means that it's, it's very important how you say something. And definitely the Biden administration is much more smooth um, and, uh, and is, is more predictable and has a better standing dialogue with, with uh, global uh, international um, countries, basically. And therefore, I think um, it, it's really, um, really going to be positive in the very short term. However, what does that mean for the long term? Um, in the longer term, uh, the Biden administration is focusing much more on technological um, advantage of the U.S., so they want to keep that up. Um, and less so on tariffs. That means short term, obviously, maybe you can even expect tariffs to be cut. Um, and therefore that will help um, the economy overall in the US and globally also in China. Um, but then on the longer term, you still have this technological decoupling between the US and China. And US will also be more bipartisan, more multilateral. They will start to um, ally with, uh, with Europe, with Japan, and um, to achieve certain changes uh, of how the Chinese economy is working. Um, and that obviously will probably lead to a long-term uh, structural difficulties between the West and China in that sense. And um, so that doesn't go away over the next couple of months, that's for sure. Um, but in the short term, that has been very positive. And we guess that it's, it's also going to be uh, keep uh, a positive momentum over, over this year. Um, so that's so much to that. On the, on the next chart then, and I think you already see it here, um, I just want to make the point that China is just too big and too important to ignore. And it becomes very obvious when you talk to, say, U.S. companies, um, when you ask them, for example, um, is China a predominant topic for you, um, then still above 80 percent say yes. And if you ask them, do you want to divest out of China, say your production chains and so forth, then above 80 percent say no. So there is just no way around China at the moment. Um, and it remains significantly important as a production hub. We have seen that even becoming more important during the crisis. I've explained that before with the protection gear. Um, but the second one is also China is really working hard to become the largest consumer market in the world. They're now still behind the US, but they're overtaking the US um, over the next couple of years. Uh, obviously, that's an estimate, um, but that's, that's, that's possible. And therefore, there is no way that the large international, say, produ uh, consumer product producing uh, companies can ignore China. So they need to have access to this market. And therefore, the West will need to collaborate with China and will um, keep opening up um, uh, or, or basically China will also keep opening up their economy to the West. So that's um, our, our base baseline outlook. Happy to take the next question. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Um, other than the strong economic recovery going um, currently in China, um, what else could be a, a driver for flows into China's onshore market? Yes. Um, so we, we already 
touched upon the flows, right? There is significantly flows um, over the last years from institutional investors. Now also retail investors are starting to allocate more. Uh, what is the reasons for that? So, I mean, the major one you can see here right away, it becomes very obvious when you compare, for example, the share of global GDP of the US and China. And um, China is almost basically catching up on that over the next 10 years, and that's the expectation. Um, and therefore, basically having the same amount of GDP, um, and obviously as China is growing more, the, the, the uh, contribution to GDP growth is significantly dominated by China. So about 30% of the GDP growth will come from China this year. Um, and what, what does that mean then? Obviously, you would expect that if you have a global equity portfolio, for example, you have a comparable uh, uh, capitalization of the equity markets and therefore also exposure in the indices. But the very opposite is true. You can see here, whilst the US produce a quarter of GDP, China almost 20%, the, the equity market of the US actually makes almost 60% of global indices. Um, and in China, it's only 5%. So there is tremendous amount of um, of uh, catch-up potential here, particularly for inclusion into global indices, but also uh, for international investors, retail and institutional, which are still significantly underinvested in China to catch up here. So just pure flows over the next couple of years should be very positive uh, for the Chinese equity and bond markets, uh, because the picture actually is very similar, as you can see here also on the bond side. Um, so there is still tremendous catch-up potential on both of these legs, basically. Um, and let me just show a, a little bit of more numbers here to answer your question. On the next slide, you can see, um, for example, uh, MSCI Emerging Markets, which um, uh, the red bar there shows the onshore China um, stock proportion in this index. You can see at the moment it's almost it's below 5%. But if you would actually capitalize it fully, in the, in the, uh, given the size of the market, you should go up to 22%. Um, so this is the concrete numbers there basically show you how much of catch-up potential there still is. Um, for, for international investors. And just to make my last point, um, to summarize all of what I just said, why is it so attractive to go into China at the moment? Um, as I said, strong relative growth, accessibility. So the regulation change, that's a new point, but that made it more accessible for, for the investor community with Stock Connect, Bond Connect. And um, you have these index inclusion that I just mentioned before. Um, and then it gives it a diversification benefit um, that I mentioned in the beginning. And last but not least, and that's important why we do active asset allocation um, for China. It is a tremendous alpha opportunity as there is, it's so dominated by retail investors. You can see that here, the red bar here basically shows how institutional investors are catching up, but it's still completely dominated by retail investors. So therefore you wanna have a active asset allocation exposure to China, which we provide um, uh, from our side as well. So in the China multi-asset strategy that you run, um, have you increased your allocation to onshore assets since we expect um, global flows to continue? Uh, perhaps you can also explain uh, briefly what China onshore assets are. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Yeah, as um, the Chinese financial markets are very complex, right? So let me first start with uh, explain a little bit um, what different asset classes there are. So you can see this chart here shows you how, how difficult and complex basically the universe is. And mainly you can diversify between uh, or, or uh, differentiate between onshore and offshore assets. How does that come? So the complexity of the Chinese market has developed over time because China has been a closed uh, financial market for a long time. Therefore, you have this onshore market that developed on the bond side and on the equity side. Um, but then you also had some channels where the, the companies onshore could finance themselves via, say, um, issuing bonds offshore in US dollars or listing their stocks in Hong Kong. They used Hong Kong as a financing hub um, to get um, uh, external uh, financial financing, basically. And over time, that started to open up. And now international investors also have access to both markets, also to the onshore market, but they're still quite decoupled. So therefore, you get this diversification benefit because um, it takes a lot of time to basically um, sort of equalize both of these markets fully. So that will only happen over the next decade or so. So therefore, at this point in time, you have um, stocks that are listed onshore, um, that are accessible with certain means like Stock Connect, for example, for international investors. And um, they're 
but mainly called A shares. And then you have the stocks that are offshore and they're called A shares. You have, as you can see here on this chart, quite a large number of different namings as well, like ADRs, for example, listed in the US and so forth. But the major distinction I just explained um, is the A share market onshore listed and the A share market, which is mostly listed in Hong Kong and is fully accessible to all international investors. Um, the same complexity you have on the bond side, you have renminbi denominated bonds, you have US dollar bonds, corporate bonds, government bonds, policy bank bonds, and so forth. So what you really want, you want to have one single stop shop where you can basically access all of these asset classes uh, in one go. And that's what uh, we as a multi-asset investor basically provide a um, asset allocation fund for China um, uh, combining all of these asset classes. And let me come back to your question now. And, and try to explain how we moved around um, in these asset classes. You asked, um, did we allocate more to onshore stocks and bonds? And um, I, I, I can only answer this question with yes, uh, significantly. And you can see that here on this chart. I know this chart is a little bit busy, but let's just focus on two points. And um, the gray bar that comes from top down, the light gray bar, you can see that this, uh, in the beginning, over the last five years, the first three years or so, there, there was no none of these gray bars, so no exposure to onshore bonds. Whilst we started to allocate uh, over the last three years significantly to renminbi bonds, that's Chinese government bonds, um, uh, so onshore renminbi denominated bonds, uh, we increased our ex exposure significantly. And from the top down, at, uh, bottom up, you can see here this yellow brownish bar. This is the onshore um, a share, so the, the, uh, the, the onshore stocks, you can see that we also started to structurally significantly allocating more to these onshore um, uh, stocks on the equity side, basically. So in combination, yes, we have um, used um, the accessibility that the Chinese government and the, the regulation offered to us, and we have been an early mover into onshore bonds and also onshore stocks, and that was tremendously uh, positive for our investors because they got access to these asset classes, and we basically combined that in a very active way, moving in and out, and therefore providing um, uh, access to all the asset classes, but also better risk-adjusted return over time for our clients. Now, how often do you move money around these different assets? And I may have, um, you may have mentioned earlier about using cash to balance out the risk in your China multi-asset strategy. Could you explain how that works exactly and how much cash do you hold now? Yeah, great question. So let, let's just stick on, on the same chart here that, that I showed before, because that actually shows the different asset classes and how dynamic we have been moving in and out. Let me make one point first. You mentioned cash. Cash is tremendously important for uh, an investment in China is because um, you have these two risky assets like Chinese credit in particular, which is a huge market and also the stock market. Um, and these two asset classes can be at very volatile at times. Um, you don't have this global diversification, right, that you would have in a global portfolio. So therefore, you need to have an asset class that is completely risk off. And that in this environment is cash. Um, and therefore, you can basically, you have to be able to move in and out of cash and, and, and uh, make this asset allocation at the right time between the different asset classes. So we go up to, uh, to uh, we can go up to 30% in cash, but we, when you look at history here, this is the, the dark gray line that comes from our bar chart that comes from the top down. You can see that we significantly allocated into cash, particularly whenever the markets have been in a downturn. So for example, when you look at summer 2018, you can see our allocation to cash has been up to 20%. Um, and we have been basically protecting um, the, the negative market environment that we had during that time. So we really move in and out of these asset class um, and cash is significantly important to us. Um, so where are we now? Let, let's just go a little bit in history also to see what we did on the equity side. So when you look at the red line here, for example, you can see that we basically move between say 38% of equities up to 60% of equities um, in history over time. We can go from 35 to 65. So we really make use of that leeway and significantly increase our equity exposure. For example, in the last quarter of last year, uh, you can see that here, that red line. Um, and that was tremendously supportive um, due to very positive returning uh, markets in the fourth quarter of last year. And you can see we came basically up from 40% to 60% during the last year. So significantly move from a bearish environment into a bullish environment. Um, where are we now? At the moment, actually, we're, we're slightly overweight equities. Um, and you asked me for the cash. In the cash, we have a sort of a moderate allocation to cash. 
um, between three and five percent at the moment. So we do not use cash significantly at the moment because we do see a positive market environment. We don't need that risk of assets uh, too strongly here. Um, yeah, so this is this is where we have been in the past um, and, and where we are now. I have a, a little bit a, a better chart to show you basically what our current allocation is. Let me go back to that one. Um, you can see that here, just to give you a full picture of how we would be invested at the moment um, in, in the Chinese, uh, in a, in a multi-asset portfolio in China. So as I said, we have a moderate allocation to cash here. Um, uh, need to be a bit cautious. This has been a little bit of an older chart. At the moment, we're about 3%, so we allocated a bit more to equities. But overall, we have a slight overweight to equities. Um, and we actually changed from preferring A share, so the onshore stocks, over the last year. They performed very well. And now we feel that the A share market is starting to perform better because the international community is putting more money in, into, into emerging markets, into China, as they are recovering as well. And that should help also the A share market. So therefore, we're starting to allocate more to the offshore stocks here as well. So you can see that um, in this gray, gray chart, overall overweight equities. Um, uh, when you look at the bond side, um, the government bonds are our least preferred asset. Um, obviously they're returning less than for example, credit and in a positive market environment, you wanna underweight them. And therefore we actually underweight government bonds. And within the credit side, we actually prefer high yield over IG. Um, high yield is very attractive um, income components. It still yields seven, eight percent. So that's uh, significantly above most of the other assets, particularly when you compare rest of the world versus U.S. high yield and so forth. That's a very, very uh, attractive yield, while at the same time you have a positive market environment. So therefore, we do like um, Chinese high yield a lot. Um, on the renminbi side, we do have a little hedge in there. We, renminbi has performed very, very strongly over the last 12 months. We do take out a little bit of risks there and we hedge out renminbi into US dollars slightly. So this is um, how we see the world and how we are positioned in the fund. Happy to take more questions. Thank you, Jan. Very insightful. Um, we now have some questions from our registrants, which we received during the registration process. And I think we have like about a hundred or so questions. Uh, one of the hottest questions uh, is this. Are China stocks overvalued currently? Do you still see opportunities? Right. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer 100 questions, but let's try uh, to pick as many as we can. So, um, But it's great to have all of this attention. So um, coming to your question, I see three reasons why not, right? Um, we do still see there is a lot of attractive places in the Chinese equity market. So first of all, when you compare Chinese equities to the peers, I mean, global equities to US equities to other markets, they don't seem particularly expensive, particularly when you compare because China has a very strong tech sector. And when you compare that to the, the, the only other or one of the major other markets that has that, which is the US, uh, you can see that basically US equities are more overvalued than Chinese equities. So therefore, uh, we don't see a particularly expensive market there. And also when you compare to different asset classes, so for example, the bonds, uh, as we know, uh, global bonds, a lot of them are yielding negative, basically. Uh, so therefore, they are very expensive. So compared to the bonds, also the equities don't look um, too expensive and actually still look quite attractive. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is also that um, there is still a lot of parts within the Chinese equity markets that are not expensive. So for example, the tech sector, yes, that worked very well. The consumer discretionary sector as well, healthcare as well. They, these are the more expensive parts of the, of the economy um, or of the equity market. But at the, on the other side, you still have um, sort of financials, for example, materials, industrials, and so forth, and they look relatively cheap. Um, and if we have a, a recovering economy, that's exactly the, the, the sectors that should outperform. And we have actually seen some of these sector rotations um, happening over, over the last uh, couple of weeks and months. So therefore, we do still think that these are very attractive uh, sectors in the Chinese market. And let me, let me finish with the third point here. Um, this is exactly when you need active asset allocation. When you fear some markets are expensive, some are still cheap, but it's hard to decide which ones, then what we provide and bring to the table is really we do active asset allocation. We analyze the market. We look at the uh, price earnings ratios and so forth. We can decide which ones, which part of the market is expensive, which is not. And we can then go in and out of the market over time um, as we see fit. Um, and this is what we do very actively and successfully and therefore produce better risk adjusted returns for our clients. So um, to summarize, 
there is still cheap parts of the market, but you have to know where, and therefore you need someone to help you actively maneuver through this market. The second question that we frequently received is uh, this, how do you differentiate between market speculation or euphoria and fundamentally sound investment in Chinese stocks, given the retail gambling environment on exchanges? Yeah, well, that's an interesting one. Um, and I think that's particularly important for China because I, I mentioned before, right, the Chinese, particularly the onshore market is driven by retail investors. So the turnover um, on a daily basis is 80, 80 to 90 percent from, from retail investors. So obviously you have a lot of euphoria going on. Uh, you have sentiment that is very important. Um, so how do you analyze, how do you, how do you make advantage of that? And I think that's why it is so, you can be so successful as an institutional investor there. If you start really, you do the groundwork, you go boots on the ground, you analyze the companies, you talk to the managers, you evaluate their earnings potential going forward, and you, you sort of calculate what is the fair value of this company. You can really find true treasures um, in China that are still uh, cheap, and have very um, uh, interesting earnings growth potential going forward. But you have to do the groundwork. And uh, the retail investors very often, obviously, um, uh, are, are less focused on that, uh, less professional in terms of um, their investment thesis and, and approach. Um, and therefore, we do think that it's ex exactly the Chinese market where you can actually uh, make use of that, um, do more work, do more analytics, and therefore outperform the retail investor um, and, and provide better returns for your clients with a lot of alpha, basically, there. So I think that's, that's, uh, that's, exact, that's a great question and it's exactly the Chinese market where you can do that uh, very professionally, yeah. Um, we have some questions from our audience um, and I think the most popular one is on ESG. Um, yeah. How does that fit into your China multi-asset strategy? Yeah, yeah well, that's a, that's a huge topic, right? Um, particularly as a European uh, house, basically, um, uh, where this topic is, 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 is at the, uh, the front head, basically, of everyone. Um, we, we take it very, very seriously and in all of our processes. So this is, ESG is really a bottom-up oriented uh, question. So you have to analyze um, the quality of every company. So if you buy a stock or if you buy a bond, you have to analyze the, quantity, uh, the quality of this company in terms of uh, environmental, social, and, and, and governmentability, and so forth. Um, and we do that rigorously. So we have a centralized team uh, that provides uh, a, a screening process for every portfolio manager. So, uh, for example, on our side, we have BNG managing the equity portfolio. And, and when they pick stocks, they get a ranking of the different stocks in terms of their ESG um, uh, rank. Um, and this is really a very uh, large uh, centralized team that helps us screening the market for that and giving every stock that we have in our portfolio has an ESG score and it flows into the investment decision of the PM. So the PM looks at the company and realizes, OK, uh, this company has a very weak, um, let's say, uh, a very weak environmental footprint. Um, do I really want to invest in that or will that be harmful going forward because the government steps in and at one point um, makes it more expensive for this company to, to make business as they do because, they, as we all know, Chinese government is, is very, uh, very serious about um, being climate aware and also changing their, their carbon usage over the next uh, 20 years. So therefore, um, we, you can expect companies that have a good ESG ranking to outperform going forward, uh, which is why we take it into consideration whenever we buy a stock or a bond from a bottom-up perspective. Um, so this is very, very significant, particularly in the Chinese environment. Yeah. Great. Do we have more questions from, our, from the audience? Let's take a look. Um, all right, we have one here. Um, the shares of the global equity index shows a much lower value for China. Um, is it because China has limits as to how investors can access the onshore market? Isn't that a, a main factor? John, if you could yeah. um, answer that. Yes, it, it, it's a great question. And I think this was the answer up until a couple of years ago, right? As I, as I explained before, there has been a separated market between the onshore market and the offshore market. And you couldn't really invest as an international investor into the onshore market and vice versa. Also, also uh, mainland Chinese investors couldn't uh, make use of, of uh, channels to invest outside. And now they opened that up. So you have now um, different means, um, you have quota systems, but particularly you have Stock Connect, 
where you can basically almost freely um, go in and out of the Chinese equity market. So over time, this will, um, uh, this will get closer together and you won't, over in, in 10 or 20 years, you won't see a difference between an onshore stock and an offshore stock anymore, right? But this takes time. And this is exactly where the opportunity lies right now. So there's a little bit of an urge in timing. Uh, you have to make use of that right now because at the moment there is still a lot of international investors not aware of that, not using these channels, not set up. Um, structurally, right, technologically, and so forth. And given that we have been an early mover, um, uh, particularly with our multi-asset um, uh, strategies uh, going into Chinese onshore markets um, in, on the bond side and on the equity side, uh, our clients really profited from being early and making advantage of that because there is still um, a lot of international flows, as I mentioned, as people are catching up to that idea that I just explained, there is still significant uh, continuous flows over the next years and therefore propping up the Chinese equity market. So there is some time urgency here, actually. Um, but I would agree with you historically that has been the case. It's not the case anymore, uh, but it takes time for the, the world of investors to wake up to this point. Great. Uh, we have time only for one last question. Um, how would the possible rise in U.S. inflation affect investments into China? Yes, um, well, that's, uh, that's a major topic at the moment. So you have seen bond yields going up. Uh, particularly in, in the US uh, because of fears of inflation, uh, but also now growth expectations. So the real rate started to jump as well over the last couple of weeks. Um, so the, let's, let, let me give you the, the first point. Inflation is uh, mostly a regional issue. Um, and, and China in particular is from their business cycle quite independent still uh, from, from globally because they're managing their business cycle, as we have seen before, quite uh, uh, quite successfully with their credit creation onshore. Um, so therefore, you cannot say that when, okay, the U.S. moves into a cyclical uptick and therefore has some inflation, that that same will happen in China because the two economies are still quite independent. So you, I would look more onto the Chinese market itself to decide whether there is an inflation scare in the Chinese assets or not. Um, but let me give you a second answer here, um, and that's more the global one. If we go into a regime where you really have secular inflation globally, uh, what does that mean for, 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 for financial assets? Obviously, that is negative for bond markets um, and can, if that happens too fast, also be negative for um, equity markets in the short run when inflation picks up too, too much. Uh, what is our view on that? We do not expect that to happen. So we have seen some increase in inflation, but at the end of the day, um, we still have, uh, a tr uh, particularly in the West, strong under under uh, capacity usage. So there is a lot of unemployment. We are still in the in a in a negative cycle, basically uh, from that. So a lot of catch up that has to happen, um, and therefore we don't expect any inflation in the in the short or near term. Um, and at the same time, also even if inflation happens, um, the the central banks they're very eager to reduce or keep bond yields low. So therefore, the most important impact that inflation has normally is kicking up the bond deals. Uh, but if you have central banks working against that very strongly with QE programs and cutting interest rates and so forth, then you don't have this negative effect on um, financial assets. So therefore, um, yes, it would be, if you had a global inflation scare, it would be negative also for Chinese assets. But our answer is, first of all, the Chinese market is quite independent from that. And second of all, we do not expect a significant increase in inflation in the near term. Thank you, John. With that, we have come to the end of today's discussion. To our viewers, we hope you enjoyed today's webcast. Do subscribe to www.dhsingapore.com for more updates. My name is Jeffrey Tan. We will see you in the next episode of Fun Watch. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you so much, Jeffrey and everyone. Goodbye.